Shalom friends, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, or excuse me, Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. Apologize for that. Uh, I wanted to take you guys on a very interesting journey here. And uh, the journey we're going to take you on is uh, where this new broadcast that we're doing on Hebrew Nation called Identifying the Messiah. Identifying the Messiah is a in-depth broadcast that is about... Um, uh, the very book I'm writing called, uh, which is not called Identifying the Messiah as far as the book, it's called What Have Rabbis Missed? Uh, but it goes into all the beautiful stories from the Tanakh and how they have been overlooked by rabbis, not just rabbis, ministers as well. Many of the beautiful stories and types in there that truly show that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah and that no other person could fit uh, this amazing prophecy better than Yeshua himself. So we wanted to take and share that with you, bring you along this journey here. And uh, last week was our first broadcast. As far as I understand, we're airing on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that could be corrected. I'm not for sure, but from what I was told, it's uh, Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Hebrew Nation is not on their website, which is Hebrew Nation, I believe it's .com. Uh, they haven't, as of yet, got the archive up for us, so our last week broadcast is not in an archive, but it should be up fairly soon, uh, identifying the Messiah. But uh, at this time, you just have to catch the broadcast live. Well, this is going to be number two, and uh, so we're going to share that with you as we record it here, and so I trust it will be a blessing for you. So let's get right into it here. Shalom Chavrim, I'm Steve Benun. You're, we're here again with uh, another exciting message. And, you know, last week we had left off on uh, identifying the Messiah, going at the very beginning from uh, Barashit, from the book of Genesis there, and uh, looking at this beautiful insights about Adam and God forming him, creating him, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. We took and we went back. We we spoke about how that when uh, Yeshua was on that cross and how that his side was opened up and the when the blood and the water came out separated from his side, how that this was truly evidence uh, that he was, that this was, uh, you know, God manifested in flesh on the cross there and that that, that was a, a beautiful type of the life of God coming out of his side there. Like we spoke about Adam being that he was put into the deep sleep. And we really didn't get much into that. We were going to save it for this week. But I wanted to back up just for a moment before we do and recap one part here uh, from uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and verse 9. And then we're going to pick back up where we left off in Genesis 21. But this part at the beginning where God formed man from the dust of the ground, verse 7. And then, of course, the Hebrew side of this is so profound where he says in Hebrew, It was God himself. It was Yahuwah Elohim. And, and, and even when we say Yahuwah, we don't know that correct translation of his name. And I know that there's many that believe that they do, and I appreciate uh, and, and respect those that have the differing opinions of, of what the divine name, the pronunciation actually is. But my personal belief is, is that it's not been revealed as of yet, because when we read in the Hebrew Matthew, uh, they were angry at Yeshua because he was able to use a divine name to raise the dead, heal the sick, and that's one thing we don't get to see in, in our regular Matthew, but it's in the Hebrew Matthew. So I really believe that there is a restoration, as Zephaniah spoke about, that is still yet to come uh, that will give that divine name once again. And my thought, two witnesses will do that. But anyway, getting to this very critical part here, it is uh, Yehovah or Yehovah, Elohim, he's the one that is breathing in the nostrils, nishmat chayim, which is, it is literally God's own life. Uh, in fact, there is another place in scripture where it says el chay, you know, which is the living God. 
And also there was a document I found recently that is uh, supposedly written by Moses. And uh, he was saying that, you know, and, and life was the one speaking to him, which is the life of God himself. Right. So but anyway, God breathes into him, uh, into his nostrils, this breath of life. It's in the plural form. And that's inc important to understand. It's plural. Why? Because uh, you have to understand there is more than one person inside of Adam at that time. And that's Eve as well. That's why there is a Chaim and not a Chai. Chaya, as we see as it continues on in the sentence here, he becomes a man becomes a living soul. He's the singular for himself, but he has a plural of that life within him. And when you get to verse 9, this is what's also important because if you remember, we know that the scripture speaks about that the tree is known by its fruit. I believe Yeshua actually spoke about that, that a tree is known by its fruit. And there's only two types of fruit that he's speaking about. And that fruit happens to be either from the tree of life or the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. Right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, hada'ato vera'a. The tree of life, ve'es ha'chayim. Now, Adam had the Chaim breathed into his nostrils. So literally, it tells us that if, if it was God himself, Yehovah breathing into the nostrils of Adam, Chaim, then that identifies that God himself is that tree of life. All right? And the serpent is the tree of because why? He came to try to implant into the Adam and Eve the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Kabbalists will tell you, and this is rabbinic Kabbalists who study Kabbalah, they will tell you that there is a holy serpent. And they will tell you that the serpent in the garden actually did good for humanity. No, he didn't. He didn't do anything good for humanity because you're only known by the fruit that you that, that is that your tree is made of either chayim the life of Jehovah or the tree of knowledge of good and evil you only know what's good and what's bad okay so this is where that's really critical that we understand that Adam had this already and notice as I mentioned to you guys last week he was he had that chaim in the plural. Why? Because Eve was within him. Just like I said, John the Baptist was a type of the bride of Christ because he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, right? That's what's so beautiful about this. So let's scroll, let's scroll down then to verse 21 uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 2 here. And this is where we had left off, and I want to pick this back up once again. And the Lord God caused uh, a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And again, no place do we see in scripture that God ever breathes into uh, Eve the breath of life. He didn't have to because she came from man. The breath was breathed within him. She came out with that fruit of the tree of life already within her. Now, some will argue that, well, God placed the cherubims to guard the way of the tree of life, lest man put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live forever. All right. How do you explain that, Steve? That's very simple. That is dealing with the, the descendants of Adam and Eve and their children. Why? Because the thing is, if you were to partake of the tree of life in a fallen state, what would you have then? You know, you would have some very demonic people with eternal life. 
I don't believe that Adam and Eve forsook their eternal life because if they had, there would be no there would be no resurrection for them. Even though they went to sleep, and even though every person in all the ages that are even from the time of Yeshua, when he come to redeem and to put back the, the, the tree of life and to breathe that life into to mankind in modern days, people have still died filled with the Holy Spirit. But it is the eternal life that has come into you once you have received this. And so therefore, you are part of that resurrection. If all you have when you go down to death is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then the only thing I can see is that you will stay in the ground, right? But there's a critical part, and I was sharing a little bit of this last week with you guys, and I want to really focus on this because uh, we have to understand in the very names of Adam and Eve, that they were called in the beginning before we even have Adam and uh, Chava, which is Adam and Eve, we see that they are called Isha and Ish. Now, if we look here, <clears throat> which I know you guys that are, are listening on the broadcast can't see this, but if you uh, have a Hebrew scripture and you're looking at this here, once we get, you know, Adam is put into that deep sleep. Once we get into uh, uh, verse 22, and God had taken from the man and made he a woman, Laisha, it's spelled Lamed Aleph Shin He. Now, it is pointed out, even by the sages, that the very name of the woman that she's called, Isha, is actually the root of this name here. We have Aleph, Sheen, and He. Aleph, Sheen, if you take those two letters by themselves, spell out the word fire. The last letter, the He, which feminizes that she is Isha, okay, that she is the woman there, that is the second letter used in the divine name of God. Okay? If we go down also, and we see that uh, in verse 23, as we get down to the last part of the verse, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man, me'ish, ki me'ish, all right? She, because from man, lakach zot, okay? Ki me'ish lakach zot, because from the man, Ish, Aleph, Yod, Shin, she was taken, or this was taken. Speaking about the woman there. And again, what do we have? We have Aleph, Yod, Shin. Again, you have the word fire, Aleph, Shin, with the Yod right in the middle of Ish for man, which now we have Ish and Isha, with the divine name itself already, we have Yah, which is God, with the fire. Now, what am I getting at right here? Within the midst of this marriage, this union of this man and this woman, was God himself. And I think it's a beautiful picture right here when we look at this. Ish and Isha. Right now, if we if you take this, what's fascinating though, when we're looking at the Messiah himself, if we go to uh, the prophecy of Hosea, this is something that so many people have totally overlooked over time is the prophecy of Hosea, and I find it fascinating here in the book of Hosea because the prophecy of Hosea, he says in here in verse 18, chapter. 2 of Hosea, verse 18, uh, it says, And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall, uh, and shall call me no more Bali. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. In modern Hebrew, uh, if you say my husband, you say Bali. It's terrible. Baal. All right? Baal, in other words, is the husband. But we use it as a modern Hebrew expression, Bali. This, I think it's absolutely terrible. But we're going to get a little deeper, though, here in Hosea chapter 2, because, again, what is it doing? It is probably overlooked by most, but this is an incredible chapter that identifies Yeshua as the Messiah. And he says, It shall be at that day, saith the Lord, Behaya beyom hahu, Naum Yehovah, 
Tika i ishi. All right, thou shalt call me ishi. Velo tika o tika re li od bali. We would call him. There's coming a day where we will not call our heavenly Father anymore. Bali, call him Balaam and worship him as if he were God, and 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 calling it Baal, the Baal worship that has plagued Israel for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of years. When Israel was dispersed. Uh, and they went into Babylon. They were serving Baal then. And yet, offering sacrifices in the temple as if everything was okay and no one pays attention to what was really going on. 70 AD, the dispersion once again. There are many in the, uh, in, in the uh, Talmudist community that would say that, uh, that the children of Israel, when they dis were dispersed in 70 AD, was not because of their own sins, but rather because of the zealots, as they were so called, which were the believers of Yeshua, that they were the cause. It was Yeshua himself and his followers that were fulfilling uh, Daniel chapter 11, where it speaks of the violent among you uh, shall try to establish the vision, but they shall stumble. And so therefore they put the blame at Yeshua and his followers as the demise of Israel in 70 AD under the Talmudist belief. Totally false. Totally false. That is a prophecy dealing with today, in today's day, where we see so much violence in the name of a reestablishment of Israel. All right, so let's take a look at Hosea's prophecy here a little deeper because it is absolutely a beautiful prophecy that has been so much overlooked. I'm going to back up to chapter excuse me, chapter 2, but we're going to go all the way back up here to verse 4. All right? Plead with your mother, plead for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband, and let her put away her harlotries from her face and her adulteries from between her breast. Now, there is a type in the story of Hosea. He's commanded to marry this prostitute. He has children by her. And, of course, this is all to... Um, to express uh, our Heavenly Father's view between the way he perceives and sees Israel with his relationship with her. So he goes on to say, Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Now it's interesting that he makes that con the, the, the statement there, that he let I lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born. Now you may not realize this. We know that when a child is born, yes, they're born, they're born naked. Yes, Israel, the birth of Israel, you know, we would be considered a born naked. But this is also going all the way back to the Garden of Eden when, when Adam and Eve were naked and they didn't know it. All right? I will not have compassion upon her children, for they are children of harlotry. Now that's provocative in itself when he says they are children of harlotry. Why? Because when we go to Levitical uh, law there, we see that God has commanded, even under Joshua, that we're not to do after the sins of the, of the, of the children that came out of, uh, or that when we were coming to take the land and we were to defeat the giants, we were not to pass our, our seed through the fire to Molech, as they were doing. And it's mentioned in Leviticus chapter 18 under all the sexual sins. What is passing your children or your seed through the fire to Molech got to do with all these sexual sins of you can't have your father's wife or your brother's wife? And, you, and I'm just paraphrasing these things. You know, you're not to commit adultery. You're not to marry uh, uh, your sister's. Uh, or your the wife the sister of your wife uh, it gives all these things that you're not supposed to do and then right in the middle he throws that in why because of the harlotry that we see right here in Hosea chapter six I mean chapter two verse six right so now if we scroll scroll down to verse eight therefore 
Here's what's interesting. Let me just go and read verse 7 as well. For their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, watch what the Lord says. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and I will make a wall against her that she shall not find her paths. How many people really understand the prophetic overtone right there in the words there? I will hedge up thy way with thorns. When Yeshua was on the cross, what did they do? What did the Roman soldiers do? They plaited a crown of thorns, put it on his head. He was the way, the truth, truth, and the life thereof, the life, the chayim. He was all of this. He was that straight and narrow way. And then they placed the thorns upon his head, put him on a cross. And when he spoke in an unknown language, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is what we have uh, generally translated there. But just for the sake of argument, we leave it like that. What is it, though? It is the same God that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. When he spoke in the midst of that bush, and he says to Moses, take off your shoes, the ground on which you are on is a holy ground. Now, that's over in uh, Exodus, or the book of Shemot, as uh, some call it there. And, and let me just take you to that real quick, because I think it's worthy that we should take a quick look. And the reason being is because, remember, we are looking at what Adam and Eve was called in the beginning. They were called Ish and Isha. And what did I say this is? It's from the word fire, and it shows that who's in the midst of the fire God himself, Ish, the man, Aleph, Yod, Shin. The Yod is God's first letter to the divine name. Eve, uh, Isha, or not Eve, but uh, the, she's called a woman. The second letter of the divine name, which is Yah. And they're what? In the midst of the fire. In other words, when God is living within you, he's in the midst of you. It's interesting because he said, wherever two or three are gathered, I'm that right there in their midst, right? So, anyway, uh, as we go here to, to uh, Genesis chapter 3, and what happens with Moses? He's on the backside of the desert, right? And he sees this interesting sight. Uh, we find in verse 3, And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight. Actually, let me back up in verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Okay? Belabat Aish. Where was the angel? In the midst of the fire. Mitoch hasene. Mitoch hasene. What is, what is hasene? Hasene, we, so we call it a bush, but it is literally a thorn bush. The same thing that was plated on Yeshua's head was where God appeared in the midst of that bush. Mitoch hasene. Vera'a vehineni hasene be'er be'esh. Okay? And the bush burned with fire. But it's it's not consumed, it's not eaten up. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight. All right, now when he goes there, from the midst of the bush, we find that God speaks to Moses, or the midst of the fire. Right? And so just like Yeshua, he's in the midst of the thorns, and from the midst of the thorns, it is, it is God himself speaking out. It's amazing. It is so amazing what we miss there. Now, second time, because we're running out of time again. Oh, please forgive me. Let's jump back to Hosea. Right? So, and when we're looking here in Hosea, I think we were in verse, uh, let's see, verse 8, I believe it was. Okay. In the midst of the thorns, right? Now, let's drop down to verse 13. And it says here, and I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her appointed seasons. It's a prophecy of what's going to happen to Israel. 
You know, he says he's going to hedge up your way with thorns, and then he tells you that your feasts and your new moons and your Sabbaths and all our appointed seasons are going to cease. 70 AD is when that happened. My brother, sister, my Jewish brother, sister, don't you realize that your way was hedged up with thorns, that Yeshua was on the cross, and you were missing it, and he said through Hosea the prophet that all these things would cease. Let's drop down to verse 17. And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and I will the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Wow. See, what happens? He sends us like it was. You know, it says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. That's verse 16. And speak tenderly unto her. So even though your new moons and your feasts have ended and you become the diaspora of Israel, we go into the wilderness journey, then God takes advantage of that because why the way has been hedged up by thorns, your new moons and your feasts have ended. And it says, I will give her the vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope and she shall respond there. And as in the days of her youth and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shall call me no more Bali. You see, the awakening for Israel, the Jewish people, was actually during the time of the, the diaspora from the time of almost 2,000 years ago. And oddly enough, how many Jews that were dispersed 2,000 years ago ended up becoming believers in Yeshua? They were no longer calling him Bali, but they were now calling him Ishi. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be mentioned by their name. When, when a Jewish person believes Yeshua to be the Mashiach, they are fulfilling the prophecy of Hosea. They are no longer Bali, but Ishi, the fire in the midst of his word. Blessings to you. Shalom, shalom. And thank you for listening. Wow. What a blessing, friends. I, and I trust that those of you that are here on Danun Institute are, are really blessed by uh, listening into this broadcast as well. I get so passionate in my heart, and it's always such a little time to bring these things out, these beautiful nuggets there. And they're much deeper than what I can even bring out in such a short broadcast like this. Uh, but we trust that it'll be a blessing for you that you listened in. And in the future, what we will be doing is we will actually, uh, they'll air on Hebrew Nation Radio, and then later they will air here on Danoon Institute. But today we wanted to share this with you uh, while we recorded just to be a blessing for you. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you.